America Meditating Radio Show. We collect wisdom, inspire each other, and empower hearts on demand 24-7. Hi, everyone. I'm Sister Jenna, host of the syndicated America Meditating Radio. We bridge divides, we seek deeper meaning, and we answer life's most compelling questions from experts around the world. Because in a world of uncertainty and division within and out, we will need answers right here, right now. Join me and guests on America Meditating Radio, a show for everyone to learn more about this amazing thing called life. The entire world wants. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. And humanity saw that the sky was not the limit. Achievement. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. Hi, I'm Devon Franklin, co-author of the book The Weight, author of the book produced by Faith, and producer of the film Miracles from Heaven. Just want to give a shout out to Sister Jenna and American Meditating Radio. I've been on the station before. I've been on the program. Uh, it's awesome, and meditation is such a powerful way to tap into all that God has for us and to find peace, love, and joy, and health in our lives. We have an exclusive screening of my new film, Miracles from Heaven, starring Jennifer Garner and Queen Latifah. And this is a film that you know is based on a true story. We've been screening it all around the country, and people have been blown away by the power of this inspirational journey of a family coping with the illness of the, the middle daughter. And a miracle shows up when they need it the most. This movie will be in theaters March 16th, all around the country. Come and see it with your whole family. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Are you in need of a tech service company that's going to deliver the best solutions for your business? Then at Chanaka is your solutions headquarters. Here we specialize in your individual needs to make sure your business shines. For more information, please call 301-417-0070 or visit us at our website at atchanaka.net. At Chanaka, where we deliver for you. Are you stressed, frustrated, or annoyed at work? You don't have to be. Soothe your mind and open your heart as Sister Jenna guides you through a peaceful, calming meditation that will prepare you to focus, be present, and most importantly, bring you back to your inner peace. He went without food, not to lose weight, but to help people lose generations of hate. While many around him rose up with violence, he sat down for peace. When others used religion as an excuse for war, he used it to remind them of love. Mahatma Gandhi made the world a far better place by reaching out with the strength he cultivated within his soul. So, pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and we're broadcasting from the beautiful Meditation Museum in the nation's capital. Well, we are getting ready to roll out our new campaign, Meditate the Vote. I'm giving you a little bit of a teaser. And the aim for the America Meditating Radio and our alliance of friends is to encourage a very healthy dialogue and uh, conversation. And, of course, consciousness in our country, especially at this particular time. I think that we are seeing a, a unique kind of a dialogue which we're not necessarily accustomed to, at least not at the public platform level in that particular caliber of leadership. And so I think it's waking us up in more ways than we might be aware of. But it's also letting us know of the ails that are in the country and perhaps been sort of swept under the rug. I want everyone to know that on May the 1st, we're going to be launching it, and we are inviting you to Start an online community with us by going to Facebook, Meditate the Vote, or Twitter, Meditate the Vote. We're also collecting videos of friends around the country who actually just want to keep amplifying the awareness that before you decide to cast those votes, do pause for a moment, be very introspective, and please note that the decision that you make will impact not only our country for the next four years, but perhaps for eight years and even beyond that. We've got to start thinking about our future generation and not just keep eating to just, you know, fulfill our own needs and, you know, every man for himself concept. I understand where we are and how we've been, you know, geared or designed to be as a nation. And I have to tell you, with the variety of individuals that come from all walks of life, from very various countries around the world, you must admit that they have brought um, and contributed in their own way some of their values and deep-rooted messages to us so that we can actually begin to make the story more wholesome and complete. At least this is my sole request to you, and I think our nation is also looking at returning to its soul. And when I talk about soul, I talk about the original qualities of the soul, the original nature of the soul. You know, these are things that come out from a very positive dimension. It's more looking at how I can make it work rather than how I can break it. It looks at how we can include everyone in the story rather than divide people. It looks at being able to have self-trust, even if I come from a background of pieces and and scraps and everything that's been bad. I'm remembering my beautiful mother, Sister Gita, and being orphaned at the age of five and not having any role model, anything at all, for her to find her reference in how she should be as a person. It's been interesting to watch her growth in her life for the last 50-something years. And then I look at my father's side, who's Indian and who's been completely loved and sheltered and taken care of and nurtured, and I've seen his story. It becomes clearer to me day by day. Every one of us, we're carrying our own soul's story. Like our very good friend Panash Desai in his book, Soul Signature, we might call it also just you've got your own script that you've come here with. And the more love you can amplify in your story, the less an effect it'll have on us when we are dealing with payback. You know, whatever we have done on our journey, or even remember half the things I do even yesterday, much less to remember everything I did 20, 40, 50 years ago or 20, 40 lifetimes ago. I have no idea. I only can look at what's happening with me today and how I'm relating to you and what's unfolding and try to use the best spiritual knowledge that I have gotten from above in those moments and situations so that I can thrive and fly. We're very excited. We're going to be having a conversation with Nick Askew in just a minute. And Nick's been doing some incredible work in filmmaking, which I'm really, really pleased that it's out there. When he came across my table about work, I went, yes, these are the kinds of individuals we really want to keep amplifying on our beautiful show that we do regularly. Before I get Nick on the line, I want us to do what we do best here, and that's to hold just a minute of a realization, remembrance, feelings of um, awareness. So just rise a little bit above as we take this moment to go into our meditation. Breathe in deeply.
rising above. Taking just a minute, I imagine stepping into a hot air balloon. The balloon slowly lifting up into the blue sky. Looking down, I see the picture of my life. Any problems seem so small. I take this moment to enjoy silence, peace, and to rest my mind. As the balloon gently descends, I return to my day with a quiet and peaceful mind. Welcome back. That was from the Just a Minute Meditation CD, Sister Genda, Sister Gendi, sorry, Rising Above. Nick Askew has a very clear mission, that is to capture the soul of this human race on the film in all its shades and form and all four corners of the world so that he might be ourselves reflected in each other. As a filmmaker, poet, and speaker, Nick travels the world helping foundations articulate their courageous pathfinding missions, organizations find and reveal their soul, and of course, most importantly, and human beings express the emotions of their pain, their joy, and much in between. Nick's Soul Biography series is followed faithfully by many around the world through his long film of the week, his insight on what it is that happens between the lens, the subject, and the viewer has profound implications for all. Today, we welcome Nick Askew to the America Meditating Radio. Nick, I love what you're doing. Nick, hello. I've been watching your work, and I absolutely love, love what you I've watched your films and they provide a pretty impact sharing about the soul and and how the soul expresses itself and I think I am curious to know on a personal how did you first become interested in filmmaking and then choosing to get into soul biographies what was it that touched the soul of Nick Yeah it, it wasn't a conscious choice I don't, I don't think I mean the truth of it is I was just sitting quietly in a in a hotel in London and then this idea appeared out of the ether that I should make films. But of course, ideas that come out of the ether and just kind of appear from nowhere with no provocative physical action in front of you that provoked it or, or anything like that, they, they don't come with any instructions or any reasons why. So I just went out and I walked out and walked around to a friend's house and borrowed his camera. And that was about 11 years ago and, and just pointed it at people and taught myself along the way. And that's that's essentially how it happens. But then, of course, retrospectively, I go, well, what on earth is this about? At the beginning, I didn't really need to know what it was about. I just did it. You know, there's a really, I have a very strong sense of the difference between knowing something certain and wanting and believing, which are very, very different experiences. And so it was one of those. But retrospectively, I go back and go, well, wow, what I'm perhaps doing is sharing what I see of people's world. And that was a way of doing that. But that would have probably mm-hmm. been my answer to you, you know, maybe a year ago. Mm-hmm. I think there's something else going on. And it, I mean, it's all completely and utterly perplexing on one level because it's so utterly mysterious. And mm. recently I've come to realize that there's something kind of arcane. There's something very connected at the heart of this whole experience with film and witnessing people. And there's a lot of stuff around it, but right at the center of it, there's this thing that happens with someone, which is probably best described as witnessing. And it's, it's very quiet, and it's very simple, and it requires nothing. And that's almost the greatest gift of, that you, one could give anyone, this ability to truly witness something with nothing in the way. Would you call witnessing a sort of a sense of... Um some, an intuitiveness about the way that you look through your own eyes of your own lens? Or I know that for me I call it a detached observer, and it doesn't mean a cold viewer. It means I've emerged my love so much that I can be removed from what I'm seeing and really see for what might be trying to communicate. So when you're turning, you know, you said that turning up and witnessing is at the heart of everything you do. Could you help our listeners to just know more about it? Because I think it's a very deep observation that you're making 
Oh yeah, you're, you're right. It is tremendously deep and tremendously confusing to many people. Like I've, I've <laughs> noticed that. Well, I think it probably confused me as well, but I've, I've been out teaching it as such. Teaching, well, I started out teaching film, the nature of this type of film and how you do it. And as I got asked more questions and realized that I didn't, couldn't explain it, I started to really think about it. And I came up with this concept, and I'm sure someone probably has before, but the way that I would describe it is there's this, so, so imagine this. So, and of course, your listeners might well not have, probably won't have ever seen anything I've done. But essentially, I create these essentially human portraits at a pace, <laughs> at a meditating pace, let's say that, black and white human portraits where people are essentially talking to almost talking to the sky, revealing, talking from their soul, you know, and there's something incredibly powerful about that. But the process of making them is myself in a quiet space with that person, with no intention whatsoever of doing anything in particular. And mm. so it's just myself, the camera, small camera, no crew, and that person. And I love that. all need to, for it to be about anything at all, or even contain any words. Everything's been removed. I realized mm -hmm. there was this, this space, best described as the space between us. So if you mm -hmm. just imagine myself sitting opposite someone, no more than a meter and a half away. Can I ask you what you are going through through those moments? Because just hearing yeah, you, I'm yeah. getting goose pimples. Like it's yeah, I mean, be... this is the really utterly and important element to this, yeah. so this is space between. And it, it's the most tremendous way to notice the entire experience of the world to make film because you are there in a room you then get to witness that again and again and again sometimes for a month as you look at the footage coming back and you realize wow i was getting in the way of someone there you know i was waiting my turn to talk i was saying too much i steered it through my thoughts to somewhere else so i noticed in this space between we believe it's clear so i could sit in the room with you say we were making a film and there's a number of ways in which I could approach that, you know, the documentary way. I would read everything I could on you and I would ask people, you know, well, <laughs> you think this could right. be about? And essentially, I'm going in there to direct a film. Right. I'm going to give you space. Of course, I'm going to give you space because I want this thing that everyone knows as authenticity. I want that embedded in the film, but I'm going to give you space. But really what I want is this tremendous film that will help the world, will move something, will change something in the world. So essentially, I have this assumption that the world is no good, terribly healthy assumption. But, but I also have all this stuff in. So I'm sitting opposite you and there's a clear space, allegedly. But in that space between, I have walked in with an entire set of needs to create a film that I've almost formulated in my mind. Uh, and certainly in its result, I want this to do good in the world. I want to help. I want it to be this. I want it to be that. So immediately I can't see you. You may have a need as well. Oh, I better perform well for Nick. Or wow, this could be a great advert for me. You know, this might bring more people into the fold. You know, you have a need. You can't see me over it. And then there's all sorts of other intangible shreds or elements between us you know our opinions of each other i'm sitting here and i'm looking at you and i'm i have an opinion oh, i've seen someone like you but i've sat with someone like you before i like the way you do this i like the way you do that all this stuff's in the middle and you back to me and so suddenly there, there's this occlusion between us what actually happens when it works and i've realized that this is probably the the point to it all is and i'm not sure i'm going to get this right because i, I still have difficulty explaining it but people do ask all the time what happens? What are you doing when you elicit something, you know, quite primal almost from people? The answer is nothing. And I think you might have put your finger on it when you said you're witnessing, you're, you're seeing someone, but from, not from yourself. I think everything's removed. It's just kind of like blank. So, for example, someone would sit there and we might, I tend to end up with the uh, making films based or set with the center of gravity around the subjects that many people won't approach because people aren't brave enough to talk about it. And then when you give them the true space, and there's just true space, people talk, they articulate what their, almost their soul has been crying out to say or to recognize or, or, or to describe for ages but have never quite had the space mm -hmm. to. And so the, the mm -hmm. films tend to be about, you know, anything from, you know, the loss of children, just the sheer fear of the world to the search for joy, anything it could be, but at a very deep level. Um, when, Brilliant. When you give space to that, 
it's like you're not even there. Well, you're not there. It's being observed yeah. from somewhere else, and the instructions are coming from somewhere else. You it's know, really, I call it the sky. Really. It doesn't really matter what it's called. It's just that, yeah. I mean, you mentioned the word intuitive. I, I, it's still intuitive. The ultimate. Well, I don't right. know. To, intuitive, the word to me seems, it's still like I'm in possession of an intuitive power, and it's not that. Mm-hmm. No, it's it's completely different. It's void of all that. Yeah. It's like, so we could be sitting, and, and it would be totally silent. I, often the films, um, more and more, actually, there's an awful lot of silence. My whole world is That's what I was going to say, Nick. I was going to say that, I bet you reach a point where the silence is really amplifying in the filming because, you know, when you move away from all the stories and all the kinds of ways we feel we have to present ourselves to the world, what's left is a silence, and that silence emotes uh, an original state of virtues and love that really doesn't need words. And I believe that, you know what I mean, so many believe that as a society we are moving away from these original innate state of awareness or of the self, a state of virtues and love. And on a personal note, how would Nick describe the current state of humanity when he looks through the lens of his own eye? Current state of humanity. Well, that's a really interesting question. I'll tell you, mm-hmm. I'll tell you why it's interesting, because I think I've probably remained in the clouds for a long time. So I, I see this thing and I live this life, which is... I don't know. Some people call it poetic or meditative, although I've never done meditation. I just tend to wander around and experience the world, and it's quite good. And I think there's come this this choice. It's like, what do I do? At the moment, I and I will get to answer your question in a roundabout way. Um, I share film, so I take these these experiences and catch them and make art out of them and, and give them to the world. Essentially, that's what, m- most of what I've been doing. But then I realised that the world is well, it's in this state of, I don't know how to describe it, it's sheer, but it's, I'm not saying trauma, it's there's something resonant that's happening. There's a change in, in the frequency, if you like, and then there's a lot of upset in all systemically, certainly, and deep inside people as well. Suddenly the world is not making sense. And I've, you know, I, I think about this sometimes, and I think there's a place for... Uh, there's definitely places for voices like yours, you know, more philosophical voices in the world. Because most voices come with a need to change the world in favor of the voice, <laughs> of that particular voice. So most things that I hear have a side. You know, it's it's almost us or them. You know, it's Democrat or it's Republican or it's you're with the environmental lobby or you're not. And it's fighting everywhere. And so what I hear is that, and you know, what I'm drawn to is, look, no, it, there's something under that you haven't considered, that there's a cause to all conflict, if you like, fighting. And I'm talking about conflict in systems, conflict between countries, between people, and, and certainly conflict within ourselves as well, which is probably where it all comes from. And that is one of, the, the cause is one of disconnection. We're just disconnected. And what I mean by disconnected is disconnected from the experience that I've just or we've just been talking about this very still experience where you suddenly realize that there's no one that you need be and there's nowhere else you need be it's it, it's almost total and utter peace it's like well here we are mm. and in that mm. moment there's no need to fight and mm. what I see of the world I mean everywhere even in supposedly peaceful places is this need to reach higher for more mm. <laughs> and it does mm. mean to me actually I, I steer clear of much of that mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know you see it viscerally with I don't know, yeah. the, the crazy drama that's playing out at the <laughs> moment on the American political scene and I'm yeah. from London but I live in America, so I'm kind of absorbed in it. Not that we have a television or anything like that, but I do listen to the radio sometimes and see it in social media. But Nick, you, you have Nick. Hmm? Yeah. What I'd love to, what I'd do to have your your lens in front of Donald Trump, and well, yeah, I just, and I'm I, saying that I would, with love. I'm, I'm saying that with love for, for 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 his soul. Even to put the lens in front of all the presidential campaigners and yeah. and to observe that scene going into that silence of the soul and the beauty, and then put them on the podium and then tell us what would you like to do for the world. <laughs> I think I, I, that would be so powerful. <laughs> no, that, well, well, here's the thing. You like. 
unconditionality yeah. is just that. There's no conditions. Right. You know, I have this deep knowing that no one needs to deserve to belong. Yeah. There's no deserving it. It just is. Mm-hmm. And so there's a total unconditionality when I'm sitting with someone. But it has to be everyone. It can't be selective. It can't be, well, you're an idiot because you're doing this, you're being racist, you're being this. That's the behavior. But underneath that all, there is this extraordinariness and it's everyone. And I know that. I've filmed in, you know, in, in a high security wing of a jail. I've filmed sinners and saints and whatever. And I've always recognized that very same still look in the eyes. And I remember years ago doing that and realizing, oh, it's the same thing. And therefore, everything has to be unconditional. So you put Donald Trump in front of a camera. And there's no, of course, there's no guarantees that someone would be quiet enough, still enough, to, to actually recognize something and be, take, and be haunted by it almost, completely taken aback by, wow, I don't need to shout at the world. This person sees me. This camera sees me. Thank God, you know, I can just let go. But, and that happens all the time. It just, there's something really strange about the camera, actually, and this is what I'm really keen to show a lot of people, that the camera you'd imagine would make people self-conscious. You know, like the world looking in makes you self-conscious, so you get a Mr. Trump or a Mr. or a Mrs. anyone, and the world's looking at them, like the world is always looking at all of us as such, and you think, oh, I better tell the world what I think it needs to hear in order to get the result that I need it to get. You know, I need them to this me, do that for me, put me here, put me there, leave me here, leave me there. Or I just need them to accept me because I need to, I, I, I kind of need to deserve to belong. When you remove all of that, everything falls away and there you are. That's probably the formula to it, if there was a formula. And it's the simplest thing anyone could give anyone, witnessing someone with nothing in between. So you sit, I can just imagine how a documentary filmmaker or a CNN interviewer might walk into the approach to an interview with Donald Trump, to use your example. And they're in there, and they're thinking about the drama about it. They've prepared it. They're trying to try and lead it down a path. They're going to try and incite him to do something that would, you know, probably unconsciously, maybe consciously, to get him to say something that would just be absurdly ridiculous, like seems to have happened a lot, and it would uh, gather eyeballs on television channels or media and stuff. It's just useless. It doesn't do right. any good. It's just rearranging the deck in favor of one TV channel or one set of people or not. And it's still looking through prejudice. Left-wing media, or no, not left-wing, let's call it Democrat media, is still prejudice, as is any lens is prejudice in some way. Because it, it looks at someone through a lens saying, you're wrong, you should be like us. I remember doing a speech once in the late 80s, the Women's National Democratic Club in D.C., Daniel Way. Um, And I wrote a terribly rude poem on the way down and read out, we're called Two Fools in a Mirror. And it was essentially about two fools on either side of an argument and they were just shouting at each other and, 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 and there would be no peace until either one could stand in front of a mirror and recognize the other. And... Uh, and I remember making a lot of Democrat, sorry, Republican jokes and then making a lot of Democrat jokes to make a point, I think, probably. But it's like, no, it's a lens. It's more fight. To think that someone's wrong, even though you kind of have this deep sense that their actions are wrong, but to mix that up and say Donald Trump is the most terrible person that ever existed doesn't help. To give no, someone I the space. Think... Uh, now, how that yeah, plays I out, I don't know. Just... If you were in front of my lens, or anyone, to be honest, um, I would probably be, I don't know, would I be brutal, or would I be terribly compassionate? No, I don't think you would. I don't know. (laughs) You have to wait for the instructions. Um, But it would be an interest. I did that in politics once. I was in Guatemala, and uh, I was filming out there, and and one Friday afternoon, I was kind of really tired. We'd been setting out to catch the soul of the country, and... um, and someone came up and said, oh, you've got to film this guy. He's, uh, he's a politician. And I went, no, no, thank you. I'm really tired and I really don't want to do that. So picture this. So I'm out, outside in this wonderful place somewhere in Guatemala, just outside Guatemala City. And there's this guy there and he's really nice. And um, he has a lot of bodyguards in the bushes with guns because that's generally what happens out there. And um, so we decided to film outside. And I go, okay, I'll do it. I've got, you know, like, I've got an hour. I could probably stay awake for an hour, so we'll do it. So I'm sitting there and... Uh, he starts to give me this speech, and 
So me being English and quite dry, I said, I'm not doing this. It's a waste of tape. This tape cost me nearly $5. So I switched the camera off and said, oh, I'm not going to do it. And he goes, no, 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 I'll try again. So he tries again. And he just gives me a different speech. You know, and you know when someone's giving you a speech because they're talking at you. They're not wondering. They've, all the words have been preformed. They've been said before. They might even have come from someone else. They're telling the world what they think the world needs to hear in order to get a result. There's, no, there's little truth in that. And so I, I switched the camera off and put it in my bag and I packed everything up, tripod down, whatever. And it's like, that's ah, not going to work. And he goes, just give me one more go. I go, okay. And uh, I don't know whether it was all the guys in the gun, with the guns in the bushes, <laughs> but I, did, I went, okay, we'll give it another go. And I think fell apart was probably the right word. There was just this very still place. And he realized that, well, this is what I believe. He realized that I was going to pay utter attention to him and I didn't need him to be anything I think that dawned on him and there was this tremendously long period of silence and then there he was and he articulated why he was in this game and actually how he become a little lost in this game and but why he was and it was extraordinary and I bet it was and apparently what happened is he actually went straight to a meeting in Congress and they were all stamping and shouting his name and cheering and stuff like that. So it, was, you know, it almost describes the situation you described at first, you know, what if Mr. X would be in front of a camera? And I don't think the camera is the important thing. I think the important thing is the giving another human being this experience of having no need. Mm, it's like I suddenly that, yeah. realize there's nothing I need. I, I don't need to be anything. I don't need to get anywhere. I'm free. I'm free mm -hmm. of the need to act. And I think that's that that's amazing. In fact, I was uh, as I was saying that I just remember an experience last month. I essentially run these, for want of a better word, retreat experiences. So I bring a bunch of people in, and you know, and, and everyone's courageous enough to have come to this knowing that they won't know why, really. They can formulate reasons and stuff. But, you know, in the end, who knows? Who knows where anything goes? Um, right. You don't need to. But I just remember someone sitting in front of a camera for the second time, actually, on a request, and being... It, it was obvious they were had done really well in life and were continually trying to reach higher to the next place. And it was, oh, I could feel it was like, oh, wow. That's, well, that's something. It's like to, to always be pushing yourself, you know, to the extreme, which is very culturally in the West, is very culturally where we seem to be. Ne enough's never enough. And I just remember, you know, I catch myself thinking, well, what am I meant to do? And, and I think, oh, no, that's my voice. That's not what I'm listening to. And so I'm just kind of listening to the silence and the space between the words all around. And then it's just like, oh, well, ask him what he... What, what needs? So we just say, well, what do you need? And of course, back came this list. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to be more compassionate about myself. I need to do this. And it's like, no, that doesn't seem right. What do you need? And so more space happened, more space, until there was this point at which the, realized, the, the person in front of me realized that he needed nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm enough. I think that's what he said. I'm enough. I don't need anything. Mm -hmm. That's an amazingly powerful space. From it there... Is. You will change the world. You will, no, you will transform the world. You won't change it because most change is just tipping in in, mm -hmm. in the favor of one rather than the other. Right. When you get to a, a point at which you don't just say the words and give lip service to them, but you, you know, you, you just have this glimmer of a moment where you recognize th 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 this me, I, I'm enough. It's okay. I hear you. And I wish I had more in more space because this conversation I don't even think is enough. I think... It is so rich that it really needs, I know, more time. It feels like we should be in a living room sitting by a fireplace and, like, being up all night <laughs> talking about these things because they're meaningful and they're important. And I, I hate to say it, I just have to come to the end of the show, and I don't want to, but before I let you go, um, any a, any plans come up to the nation's capital? If so, let us know. And uh, is there a website that our listeners can get a hold of you if they wish to? Yeah, I'll, I'll address the first one. Uh, yeah, there's a website. Ask, well, you can do that's Soul Biographies on the web, and it will come up with my stuff. But nickaskew.com, N-I-C-A-S-K-E-W.com. And there is a very large film library 
and well, let's say films, to one to ten minutes of extraordinary experiences of human beings on there and lots of poetry and thoughts and stuff like that. And I email out every week. Anyway, that's, that's the ad over. The second thing, I, sh- I, I should just come down to D.C. Yeah, yeah I think I don't know that what, what would be really cool is to gather a bunch of people and experience what I'm talking about on film. All right, we can arrange that for you at the museum. It's perfect for you. And we just need some people and willing to be courageous enough to sit in the room no matter what's going to happen and everyone know that we don't know what's going to happen and we go from there. And it's on film. And then, because we could talk about it forever, but that's not the experience of it. That's that's the thing that counts. Beautiful. Because you can't want to see it. Thank you so much for the work you're doing, my (laughs) My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. All right, all the very best. Bye. Such richness of information. Um, I didn't know where to grab from it. Thank you for joining us on the America Meditating Radio. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission. We're here to love each other the same. I want to lift our spirits. So here's Lifted by Bliss. Take care.